Hey, it's Josh. I wanted to make a quick video explaining the PID class and the JAR template, uh, both how it was developed and what resources we used, and also how you could implement it on your own, just to better educate VEX teams on PID and how it is implemented in the JAR template specifically. So the textbook for this video is An Introduction to PID Controllers by George Gilliard. It's 16 pages. I highly recommend that you read it, either before you watch the video or as you watch. Uh, a lot of the things that are mentioned in here will get glossed over in this video, but they're really, really important and can help you understand PID controllers a lot better. Uh, so let's go through the document. So basically, uh, the, the big idea is that PID is going to let us get from a start point to an end point really, really precisely and quickly by combining proportional, integral, and derivative. Uh, so if you've ever done a time-based code on your robot, or maybe a non-PID code where you just drive and then stop whenever you've reached the distance that you want, you know it doesn't work because the uh, ideally you would just stop immediately, but in reality you're going to keep uh, drifting for a little bit, or maybe you stop too early and so your robot never really finishes exactly in the same place. That's what PID is for. So we want to make a function that can basically take in an error and output a PID controller. And the way that we do this is with a class. Uh, in C++, you have classes that you can do. And so jar template uses a PID class. Uh, there are four things that we want. We're going to look at this part of the class. So uh, we have the .h file where everything is declared, and then .cpp file over here where everything is going to be defined. We'll start by looking at the .h file. It tells us what functions we're going to have, but not exactly what they do just yet. We have two constructors. One of them you'll provide the uh, starting error and then the PID and start I and then these are going to be used later for settling settle error settle time and timeout and then a different constructor where it's just error PID and start I these are the two important functions uh, compute and is settled so compute is what you use whenever you call the PID you give it an error and it outputs the output that you should output to your drive or your lift or whatever you're using your PID for and then is settled is used to check if the PID is settled. That'll take the settle error and settle time and timeout and then determine whether or not you've settled or timed out based on the input. Then we'll get to that later. So let's go back to our paper. We have uh, proportional. So the error we just do set point minus sensor value. In robot terms that's something like error equals uh, desired output minus uh, drive dot get rotation something like that maybe if it was in degrees you would do degrees but if it was in inches you would do something in inches so this is the table that shows you how the error works uh, here's where KP comes in if you just set power equal to error that's not gonna be quite right so you need power equals error times KP in jar template terms power is gonna be actually output and so here's where that is that is in PID CPP and so we'll start by computing and we'll have output equals kp times error. That's quick and easy. We input the error, we output the kp times the error. These we'll get to later, and those are the i and the d terms. So, uh, in reality, if you're implementing the PID, you need this while loop around the outside of it. The PID class doesn't have a while loop. It only lets you compute. And uh, the jar template PID class assumes that you're taking a rest of 10 milliseconds, which is why the time spent running always plus uh, always adds 10 each time it goes through the cycle. Let's go to integral. So if you've made a p-loop, maybe you did it just now if you were following along with the tutorial, you notice that your robot doesn't quite make it to the target sometimes. It'll have, uh, if it has not enough power, then it'll finish a little bit far away from the target and needs a little bit more of a push to get there. And if your P is too high, then it'll oscillate a lot and never really finish, or at least it takes a really long time to because it's oscillating. And so the integral helps you with that problem. So the integral is just the area under the curve of error versus time. What that does is that the longer you're far away from the target, the more the algorithm will try to push you toward the target. So uh, the way that you do this in code is by accumulating the error. So this uh, integral equals integral plus error times dt. In jar template, that is accumulated error 
plus equals error. Plus equals is the same as accumulated error equals accumulated error plus error. And instead of uh, integral, we just call it accumulated error for more specificity. Uh, you'll notice that this accumulated error plus equals error is inside another if statement, which we'll get to later. And uh, the output, we multiply by ki, and we add it to whatever we got from kp, and we add it to ki. So George Gilliard is going to tell us two problems that we might get here. So we've done kp plus ki. Uh, our first problem is going to be uh, that once we make it to the set point, the integral will be significant enough to keep the output power high enough to continue. If you're driving, that just means that once you finish the drive, the integral is still going to be uh, more than zero because you've been on one side of error equals zero for a while. And so it'll keep trying to push past that. The simple answer is if error equals zero or past the set point, integral equals zero. In jar template, that is uh, right here. So what this if statement does is it checks if either the error has crossed from positive to negative, that's this right here, or if error has crossed from negative to positive, that's this right here. And if either of those is the case, it sets accumulated error equal to zero, and the ki effectively gets shut off. Problem number two we get is that sometimes the integral winds up. You get a really huge integral that uh, never gets shut down, and it basically becomes useless because nothing will affect how high the integral gets. So you can either set a maximum value, you can uh, set integral to equal zero if the error is too big, or gradually increase. Uh, for jar template, we're going to do solution two. That is generally considered to be the reasonable solution two, and that's what start i is. For turning, start i is 15 degrees. You can imagine that if the robot is outside of 15 degrees, then the accumulated error will get set to zero. As soon as it's within 15 degrees, then it'll start adding up over time. Uh, the reason we have uh, ffabs error right here that is just float absolute error. So the absolute value of the error he needs to be less than start i. So negative 14 degrees, that's good. And we can have accumulated error plus equals error. Those problems are taken care of now. We can move on to the derivative. Uh, so derivative, what's that? If you've taken calculus, you know that derivative is another word for speed. So in vex, it's no different. Derivative is just another word for speed. So we have. Uh, current error minus previous error over dt, but if dt is constant, we can have current error minus previous error. Very simple. Derivative equals error minus previous error. Previous error equals error. Let's look at how we're going to implement it. Uh, pretty basic. After we set the output, we do previous error equals error, and then whenever we have the output, we do uh, add kd times error minus previous error. And we're good to go. So this incorporates p and i and d. If you're following along at home, then you notice that, yes, we have tuning. Yes, we have this other section of the paper. But for the most part, we're done coding. But the problem with this is that we still have more PID or, or more parts of our loop to tune. So we don't have any way of checking if the robot has reached its place. You don't want to check if the robot has reached the exact position because that is a little too broad. And the exact position is particularly narrow. Because if you want to say error equals zero, then the robot has to be precisely at zero inches, and that's just not going to work, ever. What we have is settle error and settle time. Settle error is uh, how far away from the target the robot can be to be considered settled. And then settle time is how long it has to be there. If your settle error is one inch and your settle time is 200 milliseconds, the robot has to be one inch from the target for 200 milliseconds, milliseconds and it'll be considered settled. Time out is something separate. so. You can see that we assign uh, settle error, settle time, and timeout. Timeout is separate. That's just if your robot isn't going to get to the target, then it moves on. So if, you get, if your turn gets stuck in the middle, then we have timeout generally equal to 4,000 milliseconds or so. So that's four seconds. If you turn and it doesn't get there, then it just moves on to the next move so that your run can keep happening even if you get stuck. With all those combined, we need a way to check if it's settled. So uh, let's look at is settled first. Is settled is just a boolean that will return true or false. So if time spent running is greater than timeout, then we want to return true. And if time spent settled is greater than settle time, then we want to return to true, basic enough. And uh, if neither of those are true, then it'll just return false because it'll make it to the end. This timeout does not equal zero is actually pretty important. If you set timeout equal to zero, then that's the same as setting it to an infinite timeout because this will never return true. Uh, 
Now let's look at how we mess with time spent running and time spent settled. So if the absolute value of the error, again, because we want to include negative errors, is less than the settle error, then we add time 10 to the time spent settled because 10 is the time we delay in our loop. Otherwise, time spent settled gets set to zero. So if you pass through the settling error and then you go out of it again, then it doesn't keep adding up the time that you had beforehand. It resets. And finally, we uh, add 10 seconds to the time spent running each time it loops through. Simple enough. So we can go straight from an error uh, create the PEID output, check how settled we are, and then return the output. And you'll see how it's implemented in Drive CPP. Over here, let's look at the first uh, function, uh, turn to angle. So when you create a PID, the class is called PID, and then you create the actual name of this. So it will say PID, turn PID. We first tell it the error, and then everything else is passed in. We uh, get turn KP, turn ki, turn kd, turn start i, everything else comes from the function that we pass it in in jar template. And then here's where we can use the is settled function to check if the PID is still not settled. Whenever it becomes settled, this while loop will exit, and we can stop both sides of the drive. So that is the uh, pretty basic explanation of jar template PID and how the class system works. I again would highly recommend that you read this uh, George Gillard paper thoroughly. It's really excellent and it's really specific for VEX. I uh, hope to see you in another video and thanks for watching.